Welcome to Inside the Firm, a podcast dedicated to small business owners and hosted by entrepreneurs, Alex Gore and Lance Psycho. Each week, they take you on their journey of how to start, run, and grow a business by bringing you inside their architecture and real estate development firm. Get a behind the scene tour of how these business leaders manage their clients and foster company culture while creating new and innovative projects. And now your host, Alex Gore and Lance Psycho. Welcome to Monday Morning Coffee with Inside the Firm. Today, we have a very special guest, all the way from the great north in Canada, Reverend Dr. David Chatka is the founder and director of Spirit Equip Ministries, focusing on spiritual disciplines. He chairs the Alliance Pray Team, developing prayer equipping resources. David also serves as Canadian director of the College of Prayer, dedicated to intercession ministry. With extensive experience leading prayer events globally, David has studied in various theological contexts and has earned four degrees. In addition to that, he's got some exciting work coming up with uh, co-authoring some books. Would love to get into that. David, welcome to the show. Well, thank you. It's a delight to be here. And uh, where are you located? What's your what, where, where, where do you where do you land here? Oh, I am. We are out of Longmont, Colorado. Okay, so you're in the the rocky, beautiful part of the world. Okay, there you go. <laughs> yeah. So before we get into exactly what you do with with the prayer and the books and everything else, you know, tell tell me how you got here. I'm always interested in the entrepreneurial journey. Are you from a family of entrepreneurs? Is there is there anything like that? Like what 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 is what sort of drove you in that sort of way? Well, the best way I can describe it is it, my my two parents were Ukrainian farmers who moved to Canada, and what they did on Friday nights was pick roots and rocks for fun. I mean, this is <laughs> yep. so I'm looking at this cultivated field. The roots are gone. The rocks are gone. And I trip over a route that my daddy missed, and I bang my head in a rock that my mama missed. And then I'm bleeding, and I'm, I'm, I'm astonished. And I look at the, the rock I hit my head on, and it's a diamond. <laughs> so most of what I've done has not been by plan. It has, I, I've tripped into this. So I, went, I didn't have a background of entrepreneurial things. But here's what happened. I wound up uh, leading prayer mobilization and writing resources while I was a local church pastor and doing that at no charge for people across my movement and across the planet. And my local church would pay the freight and they would pay for me to travel to various nations. I've, yeah. I've spoken in 17 nations. I'm going to be speaking in my 18th soon as a charity fundraiser. I'm going to be going to Vietnam. And I, am, I don't know if you know this. It's been a persecuted country. Of course, American history and Vietnamese history intertwined. Mm -hmm. uh, but when I go there, I want to give a translation of one of my books away to the people who are in the persecuted church and don't charge. I'm going to do that. So th this is the kind of thing that I've been doing before I wound up in this role. And then my, my overseer, I guess in the States, you'd call him a bishop. And that's, that's what we call him a district superintendent, but who cares? It's the same role. He looked at me and he said, look, you're doing this all the time. You're traveling, you're teaching, you're writing. If I could find a way to get you paid, would you do this? And I didn't know if I wanted to do that because <laughs> I was, you know, I'm used to being a parish priest, but basically I know you're a Catholic. Yeah. Pastor. I used yep. to be an overseer. And here's what you do when you're, when you're a local pastor, you fundraise for your church. Mm -hmm. You don't put yourself forward. You, you do the things that advance the work of your denomination, your organization, but you don't put yourself forward. And so when he said this to me, I realized that for this to work, I would have to put my shingle out and put my, I, I didn't even want my name and my face on the website. You know what I'm saying? This is, yeah. you know, cause that's just not what a pastor does, right? A pastor yeah. comes alongside people when they're in trouble and he, you know, he, he cares for the sick and he walks along. You're yeah, trying to, avoid, well, we got to avoid that deadly sin, pride, well, right? Well, that's just it. So yeah. self-promotion is not something that you do, right? Yeah. So it was so alien to me that, but I, so it took me a while to figure this out. But in the course of time, my wife and I took the decision to do this. And it's really turned into a marvelous opportunity. And here's what happened. I found myself, you know, I took the decision just as COVID was starting. And my purpose was to travel to all the fields where people already knew me and so established my base. Of course, I couldn't even get across the U.S.-Canada border. It was shut. Mm -hmm. And I, I had connections in Australia. I had booked in to go to a conference in Australia. I was supposed to speak there. Of course, the, the Australians were even worse than the Americans. They wouldn't let you in. <laughs> yeah. So it was really hard to do that. And instead, there was a bit of a sideways blessing that came out of this. I had to learn how to use social media. Now, just for the record. You know, in 2020, when this thing started, I started in January, COVID hit in March, you know, the whole mm -hmm. story. Mm -hmm. um, my son taught me how to scroll on Facebook. <laughs> so, oh, my gosh. Yeah, so we were talking about no skill at all. That's dangerous. And, well, yeah. And then I want I, I came across this ad for a company and uh, it, it was advertising how to become somebody who was well known 
how to use social media, how to get your message out, how to effectively publish. And mm-hmm. the people who were hired by that company had worked in places like Macmillan in New York and so on and so forth. So really solid um, entrepreneurs and so on. And through that process, I actually met Jack Canfield, the chicken soup for the soul author. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And so actually one of my books, this one here, this, this big one here, if you're on video, yeah. so here, there, it's me, God, how to listen, test and know when God speaks has a foreword by Jack Canfield. Oh, cool. So that those kind of connections happened because COVID happened. And were it not for COVID, I wouldn't have taken the course. I wouldn't have met him. I wouldn't have started to network with a whole bunch of other authors who were in exactly the same position as I was. All of them were stuck at home. All of them had a computer in front of them. All of them had to figure out what they're going to do with their spare time. <laughs> yep. we could, you know, and in Canada, you weren't allowed to go into a building if there were more than 10 people in it. And they didn't care if it was an insurance firm or a church or a sanctuary. They didn't care. Mm-hmm. Any building except a hospital where they allowed people to go in. But even family members couldn't go in to a hospital to visit family members. I mean, this is how severe it was up here. Oh, yeah. Was, was it the same oh, way we, we are fully. Uh, look, as somebody in Amer- on the American right, I am. we are fully aware of how insane it is. To, to us, Canada seems insane now. When I was well, growing listen, up, uh, <laughs> when, I think it still is. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, when I was listen. growing up in in North Dakota, it was everybody's a big manly frontiersman up in Canada, and then now all of a sudden, I'm like, what What happened to everybody? Well, listen, you, you can pray for us. We got a government that I want gone. <laughs> <laughs> I won't make any comment about American politics. I've got enough trouble of my own. Yeah, and anyway. I'm just observing. I'm only we are like, like I said, this is our our observation is what is going on in Canada. So well, anyway. actually, uh, most Canadians don't know. <laughs> That's uh, yeah, I believe it. Well, getting back to this, so here's the thing. I, I founded this. Uh, this organization and the my bishop set me up so that I would have charitable tax receipts for three years with the goal that I would form a Canadian charity and then become mm-hmm. somebody who would do this on my own. And I did in fact get paid for you know all these all this time. But I mean the blessing was that you know this grandma and grandpa couldn't see grandchild. And so the three-year-old learned how to use Zoom with the 86-year-old, you know, so they're hugging each other across the and this is the almost in-person meeting. It was the best that we could do. And so actually when I started, I offered, I started offering courses on Zoom and people would pay for the courses. And that's how I started to get some income because it was fee for service plus in, in you know, conference events and so on and writing. Yeah. And you put all those things together. And I, this, this company that I worked with, am I allowed to name the company? Can I say that or is that inappropriate? Oh yeah, sure. It was Bradley Communications and it's in, okay. it's in uh, Pennsylvania. Uh-huh. And uh, I became great friends with them and they were very, very, very helpful to me. They actually were the ones who first marketed Jack Canfield. Okay. They're the ones who made the chicken soup for the soul books famous. They yeah. also did that men are from Mars, women are from Venus book. And they, they took Robert Kiyosaki, the, the, the money guy. He was coached by this same company. And so, you know, the, the guy who said rich dad, poor dad, that book, that very famous uh, finance book, this, uh, they are all coached by this company. And so uh, they had much expertise and they started to teach me how to, how to, how to create pathways of entry for uh, multiple social media streams around the publishing of your book and getting your name forward and so on. And it, you know, it takes, it's a big learning curve for somebody who's never done that before. Just lots and lots and lots of learning had to happen there. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that is really how this, uh, the organization began to get some traction. And I'm finally starting to, when COVID lifted, I started to get invitations, but everybody was tentative. You know, they'd say, oh, yeah. we'll have you. They, and they usually with something like this, you have a year out or a year and a half out, you make your plans. But post COVID, it was two months or three months and sometimes even next week. They just didn't know if they could do this. I mean, I did one conference in Montreal and a week later, everything was shut down. I mean, this is, you know, this is the kind of thing that was happening. But now it's beginning to turn back into the old model of plan out for six months to a year. Oh, so that you can make your just beginning now, just starting to happen now. Yeah, makes sense. Thank God we're uh, hopefully out of there for now, but who knows what they'll throw at us next. So everybody keep praying. (laughs) Yeah, that's right. (laughs) Yeah. You can pray about the governments in both our countries. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, 100%. Um, One thing I wanted to ask you was, is about, uh, is about a, key spiritual disciplines for growth so I, a lot of one of our mantras here at one of our both of our companies and kind of everything i do actually professionally is discipline equals freedom um yes. yeah right so like if you're, if you're disciplined it's actually you're you're freeing up your schedule for people right so if i have like a for instance if i wanted to go meet with uh you know a special a friend on saturday i'm going to be deliberate 
and be disciplined and schedule that and have it in the calendar. And it's like, I'm making space in my life for important people and vice versa and all of that. And then there's all kinds of ways it plays out in business too. But I, is, uh, I think part of if in order to grow spiritually, one of the things I do is like uh, every morning that I can, because sometimes I'm on the road and it doesn't work out too well. And I'm, I'm staying in a friend's house and doesn't, but I try to pray the rosary every single morning. Uh, I try to attend mass every single Sunday, attend all the high, uh, the high uh, Catholic uh, uh, holidays, such as, uh, or, or mass times, such as like Ash Wednesday and stuff. So I feel as if that, that there's, there's a, there's an interplay here of growing spiritually as a, as a business owner. And, uh, but then how do you, what are some, what are some key disciplines that you recommend to people to try to get into that mindset? Well, regular routine, actually. So, so I, I, I married a, teach, a teacher and the teacher says, uh, plan your work, work your plan. <laughs> that's, that's, and that phrase is really helpful. Yeah. Uh, I would, I would say, oh, by the way, plan your work, work your plan. And if God interrupts your plan, work your new plan. <laughs> so yeah. there's, there's a phrase I use in the, in the book that's forwarded by the Canfield. This is, if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans, you know, just make it. Right. <laughs> At any rate, getting back to this. I really think that uh, there's this illusion out there that freedom is having multiple options to choose from. Actually, I read a Catholic author about this, and the Catholic author said, freedom is not unlimited options. Freedom is the exercise of choosing what you will commit to. And the, the illusion of our cultures, uh, mm -hmm. Western society as a whole, is that we think we should just have unlimited options and keep our options open. But if you do not make steadfast commitments to anything, you will not grow. You're saved by grace, but you grow by discipline. And uh, if you want to become a great piano player, you will make sure that you're practicing scales, even though you have already got way past the need for them. You do that so that the fine finger muscles in your fingers keep the equilibrium that they have been trained to do over the last 30 years and that kind of thing. If you start to slack in your disciplines, around ordered time, uh, ordered uh, relationships. Uh, I think first straight up, you should make a commitment never to tell a lie. Mm -hmm. That is one of the most important things that you can do inside the framework of church or business. Yeah. If somebody knows you're a liar, they're not gonna come back to your company. They're right. just not gonna do that. You gotta keep your word and you should always go a little bit over beyond that. And if you can go a little over and beyond that, it creates a bond of friendship past the ordinary business thing. Now I'll just tell you something. A real leader is a, is a leader in the volunteer world. If you're in the business world, you pay somebody, and if you don't like it, you fire them. <laughs> but if you're, a, if you're a volunteer leader, let's say you're running the PTA. Let's say that you're working in the parish church. Let's say you're working in the library, whatever. Uh, and you have to motivate people to give up their time and invest their money and get their resources and show up to be able to do a task and do it in a way that brings forth some sort of a mutual benefit to the volunteer and to the, the organization. And uh, that is harder, much, much harder to do than leading a business. And so if you can take the principles that are found with volunteer leaders, like that, so I, I have all the business books. So I've read Stephen Covey and I've, I've read yeah. Jack Welch's Straight from the Gut and I've looked at all those things. And every one of them, uh, John Max, I've read all these guys, you know, and, and the, 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 um, the leader, the leadership, the leader, oh, it's, it's a big, thick yellow book. I um, can't remember the name of the author. Anyway, it's, it's, a, it's a classic on leadership. All of them have a whole series of commitments. And the biggest one is whether or not you tell the truth or whether you're a liar. And if you can consistently commit to always keeping your word, you're far better served to promise a little and give them much than you are to promise much and give them a little. The other is to always be consistent with your time. Yeah. And it, what, and what you're talking about spiritual disciplines, and that's wise. And what I say to people who are trying to figure out how to pray, for example, mm -hmm. is I say to them, can you give God five minutes a day? <laughs> I don't say, by the way, can you, can you give me four hours? I say five minutes a day. And they say, why that? Well, isn't that enough? I said, well, what are you doing now? And they'll say nothing. I say, well, five minutes is better than nothing <laughs> because the habit is more important than the time. So if you have a business routine that you're trying to establish, establish a small commitment around the framework of the decision you're trying to make. And as you are consistent with your five minute commitment, it grows to 10. And as you're consistent with your 10 minute commitment, it grows to 15 and so on. You grow into excellence one small step at a time. You grow into the discipline of your organization one small step at a time. The other thing you need to do is to make sure that you're constantly and regularly not only taking care of your customers, and in my case, my parishioners or my, or my outreach, you have to make sure that they, they are aware that you actually care. 
And if there's something that can be done when you're in the middle of this, even something as simple as a thank you card for their business or something like this, a thank you email or, mm -hmm, a, mm -hmm. or a phone call when there's no business contract on the line, just checking in, how you doing? Something like that, I found it yields huge dividends. So back in the day, I, I had access to, to people's birthdays. And when the church was small, you could do this. You can't do this when the church is big and you can't mm -hmm. do this when the company's big. Yeah. You can call some up and say, happy birthday. You could send a card on their birthday date if you have to gather that information. Something like yeah. this. Yeah. Simple little practices. But you, st you, you, so when you start, you start with what I call a pocket full of chains in your pocket. You got the trust pocket full. And then as you start to enter into your assignment, whatever that happens to be, let's say you're a business person or you're a banker, as you continue to help the person achieve what they need rather than what you want to sell them, as you help them achieve the need, you, uh, you get a little more change in your pocket. If you don't help them achieve the need, the change is removed from your pocket. And in the course of time, you become bankrupt. Yeah. So there's always a, a, a reciprocal kind of thing going on with everybody you're serving. If you can see your work as an act of love and service, it becomes something far better than an act of achieving profit. And uh, the companies that succeed are the ones that do that. Yeah. Does that make sense? Oh, 100% act of service all day long. That was the homily last uh last mass it was it was fantastic actually it was on ash wednesday it was a, that's exactly what it was and then there was the the part about the pride you know pushing that down and serving and it all works out if if you're doing yeah. it that way and then the truth at the at the sort of the core of it all i totally agree john e32 is my favorite one of my favorite bible verses it's really that sort of transformed my life because there's been multiple truths that have come out in my life some okay. some crazy uh that you wouldn't <laughs> even predict where it's like uh, that just kind of set me free, uh, literally, you know, with getting a rid, rid of a lot of sort of anger. And Is that and... the one, you should know the truth, the truth should make you free, is that the one? Yes, yep. Oh, it's a it's beautiful text. Yeah, yeah, actually, bottom line is, the other thing, I'll say one more discipline. If your company can practice generosity, it always booms back. There's there's something going on in this creation where you do a good thing, it mm -hmm. boomerangs back and it turns back to bless you. It might be, and you have to make that, a, how do I say this, consistent practice. Yeah. That there has to be a decision in the framework of your organization that you don't just serve the bottom line, but you serve the constituency that you're working with. And to practice generosity, you're going to do the following thing once a week, once a day, however, how frequently you do it. So some companies sponsor things like the Multiple uh, Dystrophy Association. People, a company sponsor um, Cancer Society or whatever the issue happens to be. Uh, so I walk into my bank and there's, there's a pink sign because they're trying to eliminate breast cancer. Everybody knows a female. Everybody's yep. got a sister. Everybody's got a mother. And when I walk into that bank and I see that sign about making a donation to the Cancer Society to eliminate breast cancer, I know they're taking 1% of their profit line and they're putting it in that organization. It makes me want to go back there. The practice of generosity does that too. Yeah. Uh, if, uh, I would, you're, you, you have such good stories, David. I wonder if you could share one with us about maybe a memorable transformation that you've had at any of your prayer events. You know, something that honestly, it's like you said, you have a plan and then God laughs. And maybe yes. it was something <laughs> like that. Yeah. Well, let, let me, let me how, how do I get at this? I just did an event in uh, just north of Calgary, Alberta. I just did one. And uh, while I was there, I wanted to do a service on, on, on prayer for healing, you know, and, uh, and the, the pastor, I said to him, how long have you been in the church? He said, six years. I said, oh, okay. How often have you done prayer for healing? He said, three times. <laughs> he said, three times in six years. He said, yes, we don't do it very often. I said, why not? He said, because I'm scared nothing's going to happen. Yeah. I said, well, what about consolation? And what about care and love? And when people feel hands placed on, what about that? And he said, well, you know what? Let's do that. And by the way, I'll get four people ready to assist you. Now, mm -hmm. that congregation was a small one. It was about 150 people. And I finished my message. I said, oh, by the way, if you would like to just have a, we had the Lord's Supper. You call it mass, call it what you will. Yeah, when you, when you walk up to receive it, we'll have a prayer station beside each of these stations and you can receive that. And there's a lady who walked up to me. She's crying, just absolutely crying. And she said, you know, I trained my voice. I have an operatic voice. And I spent, uh, all, you know, my whole childhood leading into my adulthood developing this voice. And I wanted to use it for God. Then I had to have a thyroid surgery and it wrecked my larynx and I've not been able to sing for 20 years. I said, oh, what do you do with that? She said, well, I'm serving God the only way I can. I can play the piano, but I can't sing. Mm -hmm. Do you think the Lord would touch me? I said, we can always ask. <laughs> so I put my hand on with her permission. Of course, you don't touch a female. 
you don't talk to anybody because yeah. there's no, you, you ask before you do this yeah because there's too, too many view speakers out there so i said may i place my hand on your shoulder she said yes and i did and suddenly it was like there was fire and heat and compassion focused on together all at once this is three weeks old the story just happened and so uh as i was praying we, we, she she started to weep and she said i i don't know what it is but something's happened i said thank you we're, let, we're having service tonight you can come back she sang all that afternoon to the Lord. She, she, her voice was restored. It happened three weeks ago while I was at that church just north of Calgary. And so, I mean, when that happens, you, you begin to say, I need to teach people how to do this. So my organization is to, is, to, is to develop spiritual disciplines so that people can do something like that in a productive, helpful manner. Yeah. So that, ju that just happened. We're talking just. Uh, actually, while I was talking to you, my computer went ding. It was somebody else that... Uh, that received a great blessing when I was praying with her from that same church. So this is a fresh relationship. So that those kinds of things take place all the time when I go and do an event. There's always one or two people who receive some kind of a blessing. Now, the other side of that, there's always people who don't. Yeah. And so uh, what I wanted to do in, in writing the Healing Prayer book, and it's a co-write with a million selling author. Now, for your audience, I know that you're mostly entrepreneurs who are listening to this. Mm -hmm. I will tell you this, running a nonprofit and then turning that into a charity is a lot of work. <laughs> so, and it requires just as much business acumen as it does to establish a business. And in my case, I'm working with volunteers and I have to motivate them to be able to want to come alongside. So they have to know that they're doing something that is of service or help to the community, of service of help to themselves, and of service and help to God. Anyway, in, in this case, I was, um, I was, um, oh, I was going to tell you what was it? I, I wanted, so, so we created a training manual. That's what we did. Yeah. So the book is designed to be a training manual so that people can do this. And my book does not say everybody's going to get healed. My book says everybody's going to receive comfort. And you teach churches to do that, to be places mm -hmm. where love can be found, where grace can be found, where kindness can be found, where care for the other can be found. And in the middle of all of this, while you are giving care, in the middle of all of this, sometimes you get these amazing experiences of divine presence where it shows up and the power flows through you and you just can't even believe it's happening. In fact, the way I started is hilarious. Do you want to hear that story around the Yeah. Show? Yeah. Okay. So, so here's what I, I was a seminary student and I went to my seminary and it had liberal and conservative faculty. All right. And so one of these mixed things, it was one of those denominations in the sure. mainland was mixed. See, anyway, I go in and one of the profs says something about the Bible not being true. And I said something to the effect that it was, see, and in the middle of that, there was a guy in the class who could have been a stand up comic. I mean, the guy was absolutely hilarious. And he, and he, I don't know if he did this because he was insecure or because he was completely secure, but he would, he had this ability to look at you and everybody in the room would burst out laughing. Anyway, I'm in the class. I say something about Jesus actually walking on water. It's not a myth and that kind of thing. And he lobs the humor grenade into the middle of the room looking for the explosion. <laughs> the, the whole room bursts into laughter. And it's hilarious the way he says this thing, but I was the object of the humor, right? Uh. Uh -huh. What kind of a brain dead, wooden headed, you know, thinker are you that you believe that Jesus actually walked on water? That kind of thing. Anyway, yeah. he didn't say that bluntly. He said it with humor, and that's far more effective. Oh, 100%. Anyway, oh, yeah, but it hurt, you know. So then I go to the next class, and some <laughs> other prop says something godly, and then somebody says something nasty. I defend the scripture, and the same guys in the class, because we were in a cohort together, and we had about six classes together. Anyway, he lobs the humor grenade. The room explodes in laughter. I'm the object of the humor. This went on over and over and over again. Uh, oh, he did it again to you? Yes. Oh, okay, wow. So, here's, so we had a mutual friend. Her, I called yeah. her Susie in the book. And Susie was a real kind, sweet, gentle, do unto others you would have them do unto you kind of person, right? Anyway, um, I just said to myself, it's very clear I'm never going to be friends with that guy. <laughs> I can't defend myself. He's too funny. I'm not going to be able to beat this. So I just avoid him. And if he was in the class, I had to rec put my guard up before I told my story or whatever. Anyway, about two, three months in, I am walking across the plaza to get to a class. And this kind, sweet lady who's mutual friends walks up to me and says, how you doing, David? I said, oh, I'm fine. How about you? She said, fine. You know, the comedian from the class, I said, oh, yeah, I know. the." Fitness. He said, well, you see that hospital six blocks down the road? I said, yeah, he's in there. I said, oh, what's wrong? And actually, I didn't feel bad. <laughs> to repent of my bad attitude anyway <laughs> so, so and then i said oh what's wrong and she said he's very sick he's got phlebitis and i don't know if your audience would know that what that is i don't even a, know okay it was a clot in his okay mouth. 
Okay, and actually, way back in the day, Richard Nixon had some bites when he was just being impeached, that kind of thing, and he decided mm -hmm. to resign. Anyway, if the clot breaks free, it travels through your blood system, and if it hits your lung or your brain, 95 times out of 100, you're dead. I mean, this is a very, very serious affliction. And uh, and so he, he winds up in the hospital, and uh, the girl says something. She said, oh, is he getting good care, I said? And she said, yes, he is. And she asked, he, he asked me to ask you something. I said, what's that? But he asked if you would come and pray for his healing. I said, what? <laughs> That's crazy. He's made fun of my faith over and over and over. Why yeah. are you, what are you doing being, he's been cruel, I said. Yeah. I, I had a couple other things in the background. Number one, I'd received no training for how to do this. Number two, I was green as, as a rookie could be, and I had no experience at all of doing this. And number three, I'd never met anybody who had been healed through this thing called the prayer of faith, where the, where the power of God had come upon them. I just didn't know if they existed. Anyway, I knew it was in the Bible, but I didn't know if that was for another era. Did God still do that? Was this something for contemporary Americans and Canadians? I don't know. I just, I can't, I couldn't figure this out. So, mm -hmm. But she said, he wants you to come. I said, I'm not going. She said, why not? I said, because he's been cruel. He's made fun of me. He's mocked us in front of our peers. Yeah. You know this. And she said, yes, I'll go talk to him. I said, well, you can talk to him if you want. I'm not going. So I went off to my class. The next day I'm in the coffee lounge at the school. The same girl walks up and she said, oh, I want to talk to our friend. I said, oh, okay, what happened? She said, well, he's terrifically sorry. He's sad that he did that to you. He still wants you to come. I said, I'm not going. <laughs> no, it, it was actually fear-based. I oh, yeah. was terrified. I didn't know what I was doing. I was afraid yeah. I nothing would happen. And I was mm -hmm. afraid to be mocked, right? Yeah. And so I said, so next day, I'm, I'm going across the same plaza. She met me. <clears> and she said, David, how you doing? I said, I'm okay. I said, did you go and see our friend? I said, no. <laughs> and then, I don't know if you've ever been told off by your mother. Okay. This oh yeah. A few times. No, no. Yes. This girl knew my middle initial, so oh, she stomps her foot. The fire comes out of her yeah. personality, you know. And she said, "David Archonka, yeah, yeah, aren't you going around this school telling everybody the Bible is the word of God and it's supposed to be obeyed?" I said, "Yes." She said, "Well, how about this scripture? I was sick and you visited me." I thought. Oh no! <laughs> I'm gonna have to go gotcha. out of sheer obedience to the yep. teaching of Christ. I'm gonna have to go. So anyway, I said to the girl, "Look, it says sick and visit. It doesn't say sick and pray." She said, "Sick and visit her to whatever. You gotta go. The Bible says you got." So I, so I, you know, I swallowed hard. Yeah. Did my class, and then I walked the six blocks to the hospital. I walk in and I go into the room and man, it's serious. You can see there's monitors and there's videos mm -hmm. and there's nurses walking in and out and medications and cups on his bedside. And he's pale and he's haggard and he looks scared. Now he's all of 27 and he's married, no kids yet. Anyway, he's, uh, he looks at me and he's, uh, I said, lovely weather. We're happy. <laughs> I didn't know what to do. So I visited about the weather and then I visited about his course load, how he was keeping up. And I said, mm -hmm. well, I visited you now I can leave. That's what I thought I would do. It didn't say pray. It said visit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so he said, wait, aren't you? aren't you going to pray? I said, wait a minute. Let, let, let me just be clear here. You, every time I've said anything about this being real, this being true, about the Bible, you know, Jesus, that anytime I've done this, there's no atheists yeah. in foxholes, right? I mean, well, it's kind yeah, of like that. Yeah. You have lobbed the humor grenade. You, 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 you've mocked me in front of our peers is what I said. Mm -hmm. Why in the name of all this whole, you want me to pray for you when you admit you made fun of my faith? Yeah. And the man, he was like 27 years old, adult, you know, looked like a strong, healthy body, except for yeah. this affliction. He starts to burst into gales. Of, oh, he's laughing. He's crying and crying. And he, after these hacking sobs, he says, I am so sorry I did that to you. But you're the only guy I know who actually believes those stories are true. Won't you please come and pray for me? I don't want to die. I have phlebitis. I could die. And, you know, what are you going to do? I mean, I'm looking at him. Yeah. I still didn't know what to do. <laughs> I, never, I didn't know. I'd never done it before. So okay. I saw it, but I remember in the Bible, Jesus put his hand on people. When he yes. Came. Okay. I remember that. So I thought, okay. So I went around. I said, where's the phlebitis? He said, left arm, just above the elbow. Yeah. Said, May I put my hand there? He said, yes, put my hand there, put my hand in his head. And I prayed some kind of a mumbling, stumbling, fumbling, bumbling prayer. I have no remember members of what I said. Yeah, I know it was honest. I know that I was praying an honest prayer. So yeah, oh God, this man's in trouble. Heal him, something mm -hmm. like that. And this is the this is the thing that changed me forever, and it led to the production of this book. It started the journey. Suddenly, it was like the room filled 
with a fragrance of compassion and love and fire, the whole room. And then it came into my heart and just expanded inside of me. And I, I began, I, it became focused, utterly, totally, completely focused. All I could see was this man and his need of healing. And I had a conviction in my soul that the Lord wanted him well and that I must pray to that end. And I kept praying and I don't know what I said, but that fiery heat rose inside of me, went down my arm and went into him. And he said, what is that fiery presence? entering my body through your hand. I said, that's the power of Jesus spirit. He's healing you. And then I ran out of the room. <laughs> because, because I was terrified. I'm sure but, you were. Well, no, I never felt anything like that. I understand. Yeah. And it was just so, pro I mean, it just wasn't in the culture. I bet it? it was shocking. Yeah. It, well, it more than it was, I don't know. Shocking is the word. Astonishing is better. I think. Okay. Astonishing. And so, but I ran out. And, you know, and then I go about my day and the next yeah. day, uh, the very next day, he's in the school in the coffee lounge. Yeah. And I walked up and said, you're here. He said, yeah. And then he pulls me into what is an old, one of these old stone 19th century buildings. He pulls uh -huh. me behind one of these pillars and looks in every direction. He says, that prayer changed my life. And I said, thank you. And I ran away again. The next class I had with him, yeah. I said something to defend the scripture. <laughs> And he told a joke. Everybody was expecting him to make fun of unbelief. Yeah. He rather he made fun of unbelief, not fun of faith. He didn't make fun of my faith. He yeah. made fun of unbelief. And the whole room burst into laughter. But the object of the humor was the person who said, God didn't do that anymore. Yeah. And for the next series of months, he did that. And uh, that the story I just told you is in my healing prayer book. But uh, the, the, the conclusion of the story is not. So I'll tell you the rest of the story. Okay. So the denomination required us to go and have a summer field. So we'd, we'd go to school till May. And then from May, June, July, August, we'd be in a church overseeing whatever. We couldn't do the sacraments, but we could do everything else. And so the, some seasoned pastor would walk us through whatever. And we'd learn this and that skill and so on. It was a great summer. And I had a marvelous time doing that because it was what I'd hoped to do with my life calling anyway. So I get to September. I go back to school. A guy races up to me. And uh, he had passed me his phone number before I left. And he said, you didn't call me. I said, I didn't have any trouble. He said, you have trouble, you call me. And then a couple of months in, we had a party. And we were gathering this social thing and all the students are there. And there's this guy who's been healed of phlebitis. There's his wife. There's the girl who asked me to pray for him. And I walk up to them. And we're talking about, you know, fluff and stuff. Nothing really serious because it's a party. And the two girls start giving him the elbow. <laughs> and they say, hey. You got to tell Chotkin what happened. Tell Chotkin what happened. He said, oh, I don't want to tell Chotkin what happened. So eventually, he, this, this is what happened. He said it. When I left, the nurse walked in and he said, I can go home now. My friend from the Bible college prayed Jesus has healed me. <laughs> and she said, we don't do those things around here. And he, the, she, he said, well, what do you have to do? She said, I have to run some tests. And he said, then run the tests. I want to get out of here. I think Jesus has healed me. And the lady said, uh, well, I've just come to get you because you're due for them. So they walked, walked they rolled down the hall. They ran the tests. Every trace of phlebitis was gone from his body. Wow. And he was released that night. And of course, his wife picks him up and they go home and they're thankful. They're very thankful. And they actually do something they weren't used to doing. They knelt beside the bed and they thank God for the fact that he was now well. This is amazing. So mm -hmm. he goes to sleep and he has a dream in the night. And in the dream. He senses that God is talking. To him. I don't know how he, he didn't sure. tell me how he heard this, but he said yeah. that in, the message he heard was when my servant David defends the integrity of my word, defend him. And he did. Oh, amazing. Yeah. So here's what, so then in, in this moment in, in the party, he looked at me and he said, the only time I ever got a phone call from God, it was for you. <laughs> <laughs> Presence in the whole room for so long. Yeah. But that moment started the study. That moment began this journey of attempting to understand how this works. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's listen for, for the record. I have prayed with people and they've not become well. Sure. They've received comfort. I have prayed with people and there's been miraculous healings. I just told you one from three weeks yeah. ago. I have prayed with people where there's uh, just kind of a mixed thing and they're given a pathway to a remedy. That I've prayed with people and uh, we just have question marks. We sense consolation, but we sense no answer. And all these things are part of the journey, right? And so in the book, I outlined five different steps. And I want, listen, the reason I founded Spirit Equipped Ministries is because churches need to train this. It's not enough just to say, oh, by the way, it happens. 
you have to train people to be able to do this because I was just a bumbling idiot stumbling over my own lips when I was trying to speak about the thing. I had not a clue, right? And so I've dedicated the, oh, the last several decades of my life to doing that research. And here's what we've come up with. There are five pathways named in the book. The first is the, the instant heal, which I just told you about. The second is the pathway to a remedy. The third is natural healing. It's because, and you know this, you cut your finger and you wash it, you put a bandage on it, it heals. Now, my wife was healed of muscular dystrophy. And when she damaged a muscle before, the muscle would not heal. And after she was healed, all the muscle tissue did heal. So yeah. I am convinced. So like she got the instant miracle. I didn't have a chance to tell you that story, but it's a remarkable one. Medically verified both sides. Our doctor of five years watched her decline with muscular dystrophy, and he waited three years to write the letter before he said, yes, the muscular dystrophy is gone because he couldn't believe it. Anyway, there's, the, there's natural healing. There is uh, sparing the suffering for some reason that we cannot understand. Mm -hmm. And then last of all, there's the miraculous crossing. Now, here's tell you, science and faith go like this. So pathway one is this one. This is, this is science. This is where you do empirical thought. Yeah. And by the way, this also works in, in business. You see something and you follow the trajectory. You make up an idea and you test the idea. And then you decide this particular uh, approach brings healing to this particular affliction. That's what science does. And faith says, well, God can heal anything. God can heal anything. And sometimes the pathways overlap. And sometimes they're distinct and separate. Sure. And they're not in conflict with each other. Many believers don't know that faith and science don't have to fight each other. They don't. They simply yeah. don't. I love that. Well, they, they, they overlap. And the last, of course, is the miraculous crossing. It's your time. You've done your bit for king and country. I should say for president and, and nation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. E plume has heard him in your country. <laughs> yeah. so, but getting back to this. So the, the book is designed to teach those five pathways as legitimate pathways. Sure. Some Christians say nobody gets healed. Some Christians say you always get healed. Some go around making claims and get people disappointed. But all five are part of the package and they're found in Scripture. Yeah. David, you have been such a phenomenal guest. I knew you would be. I'm so glad we could cross paths and Providence brought us here. I have two questions that I ask every guest as we run up on your half hour. And that is, first one is knowing what you know now, if you can go back in time when you first started all of this, yep. what is one piece of advice you give your former self? I would say, uh, whatever you do, uh, don't be afraid to speak what you believe in a forthright manner and don't be afraid. That's yeah. the first. That, that. The other thing I'd say is, oh, by the way, uh, buy gold before Nixon takes it off the gold standard. <laughs> <laughs> David, you are a gem. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with that. That's 100% true. Uh, where can people find and follow you if they want to get in touch with you uh, and, and find the book and all that good stuff? Well, the, the Healing Prayer book, anywhere books are sold, you can go to Walmart and get the book. Just look for Healing Prayer, and, and you can. if it's not there, you can order it. That's easy. But if you want to be in touch with me, um, you, you go to my website, which is www.spirit, like in Holy Spirit, equip, like in equipment, spiritequip.com, because my organization equips people in the spirit. That's what I'm trying to do. Uh, spiritequip.com. And all the links to all my social media are found in there. There's a link to my Facebook page. There's a link to the YouTube channel. There's a link to my to my Instagram account, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And from time to time, I do blogs and I also do courses and I advertise them on the website and I do that on Facebook as well. So that's the easiest way to be in touch with me. And nobody else's name spelt like this, C-H-O-T-K-A, yeah. is around writing books on prayer for healing. So, <laughs> so you He's findable. Like, yes, there's, I've written five books. Yeah. And uh, the four of them, one, one just got released back to me and I'm going to republish it. I'm cool. rewriting it. And that's the one that's going to Vietnam. I'm, I'm going to be traveling to Vietnam and I'm going to meet the persecuted church. And I, I'm going to, I'm, my book's being translated into Vietnamese. And I want to give that to the Vietnamese churches. I want to do that. So Fantastic. that's going to happen in the fall. Yeah, great. David, thanks again for being on the show. We appreciate your time. Thank you very much. It's been a joy.